All right. This last uh, session of the afternoon um, is going to take um, a little bit different spin, and due to a family emergency, Dr. Paul Lasley can't join us, but the man was prepared, and he has recorded his presentation. Let me give you his introduction. Dr. Lasley, Paul Lasley, is a professor of rural sociology in the Department of Sociology at Iowa State University in Ames. He completed his bachelor's science and master's degree at the University of Missouri and animal husbandry and sociology, respectively. He earned a PhD in rural sociology from the University of Missouri in 1981. His major focus is understanding the linkages between rural communities and farming and the interface with rural America. The author of more than 100 articles, book chapters, and extension reports, Dr. Lasley has explored the changing nature of farming and the implication for rural places. The title of his talk is The Sociological Impact of Livestock and Poultry Industries in the United States. All right? Well, good afternoon. I'm Paul Lashley. I can't be at your conference today, and I know after a, a full day of discussion of the issues surrounding livestock and poultry industry, uh, you may be getting a little tired of seeing speakers, and now you get me on video. Uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't make today's conference, but I did want to share with you at least uh, some of my observations on the sociological impacts of livestock and poultry industries on the United States. I thought about that, and you know, in some ways, it's kind of a, uh, a, a bit of a misnomer to assume that it's just a one-way one uh, impact, but we really ought to think about not only the impacts of livestock on society, but we also need to think about the impacts of society on livestock production and processing. So as this graph, as this PowerPoint shows, we really have to look at that double arrow because many of the issues that I think that we're talking about, when we talk about the human dimensions of agriculture is in fact uh, in that interface between livestock and and society. So I want to share with you my interest as a sociologist, as well as an animal scientist. My bachelor's degree was in animal science. Uh, but I will share with you at least my perspective on some of these issues. The first question we should ask is how have relationships between animals and people changed? Where do we derive our values, beliefs, and attitudes about animals? That's really the human component uh, that I want to spend most of my time on. And then I will conclude with what are some things that might be available to demonstrate good animal husbandry of both livestock and poultry? What I believe our industry faces is really one of the changed culture of animal agriculture. As a sociologist, I focus on that human dimension uh, of the last two syllables of agriculture, the culture, which includes the human dimensions of our preferences, our values, beliefs, our attitudes, our expectations and opinions. And most of this surrounds what is versus what should be. We are faced with an emergent set of new values and beliefs about animal agriculture and how food should be produced. So let's talk just a moment about the human component. This will, this will substitute for your introductory sociology course for those of you uh, that may be a bit rusty. We have to talk about four components, uh, values. Values are those important and lasting beliefs or ideals that each of us holds about what is good, bad, right, wrong, desirable, undesirable. These are values that we oftentimes learned as children and carry throughout our lifetime. A second component are beliefs. Beliefs are, uh, are assumed truths. They can't be proven, but they're beliefs. And so we all hold beliefs about religion, uh, about the future, about democracy, about world affairs, we have beliefs that may in fact be assumed truths. We also have a third dimension called attitudes, and attitudes are 
those tendencies for us to respond in certain ways to an idea, an object, a new idea or situation. And those attitudes and beliefs and values inform the fourth dimension, behaviors. And, and we can infer from some, from some cases, people's attitudes, values, and beliefs from their behaviors. But we also know that attitudes, values, and beliefs inform how we act. So when we look at the societal impact, so let's talk about some major trends impacting livestock and poultry production in the United States. Certainly urbanization, I'll come back to that in just a moment. The industrialization, the role of technology and how it has shaped uh, animal production. Certainly we recognize the scale of operations that are now made possible through uh, technology. I'll also introduce you to a term some of you may not be familiar with, anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism, and as well as perceptions of the loss of husbandry that many allege. We think about the disconnect between people and, and livestock production system appears to be growing. The disconnect appears to be growing between people and livestock, but at the same time, the relationships between people and non-livestock animals are increasing. At one time in American history, everyone was a farmer and nearly every farm had livestock. Livestock production now has become very specialized. Uh, many farms, in fact, no longer have livestock. And owing to the transformation of our society, a more urban society, many people lack ties to livestock. But interestingly enough, ties around animals has, has strengthened. For example, in 2018, it is estimated that almost 70% of households had a pet or a companion animal. We see the same trend in terms of hunting and fishing uh, rates are stagnant to declining. But livestock photography, I'm sorry, wildlife photography and birding is actually increasing. Recent estimates are that there are 11 to 12 uh, million hunters in the United States compares to about 86 million who reported that they either watched or, or photographed uh, wildlife, uh, a sevenfold difference. You're familiar with this trend of uh, the decline in, in urban pop, uh, the increase in urban population, the decline of rural population. You can see from this graph at the first census, about nine out of 10 Americans lived uh, in, ur in rural places. That's declined to about one in four. If we look more specifically at the farm population, which is the gray bar here, this is simply the proportion of uh, rural population, we can see that by 2000, it was down around 2%. So this urbanization has contributed to different values and different experiences around livestock. Let's look briefly at the historic paradigm of the relationship between uh, people and livestock. Many of us recall a time in which agriculture and rural life were closely integrated. Most people who lived in rural America were farmers that had livestock and were dependent upon animals on a daily basis. Animal husbandry was an everyday practice. People, both rural and urban, had multifaceted relationships with animals and livestock, including horses for transportation and draft, but also cattle, hogs, poultry, sheep, along with companion animals or pets and wildlife. The dominant culture uh, uh, that was that we were bound together by common experiences and similar values and beliefs, if you will, a shared culture and understanding of the appreciation of animals and livestock. So let's look at just a briefly some pictures or images of traditional livestock paradigm. Um, and I have several that highlight 
the close interaction between people and livestock. And, and we see that across age and across gender. Again, I want to sort of summarize this in just a moment, but you, you to these pictures, I hope inform you about some of the values that people held about livestock production. If we were doing a workshop today, the next part of your assignment would be to ask you what were the values reflected in those images? So I'm going to help you along. Pride in stockmanship or husbandry. You can see that in the smiles of the people as they're taking care of their animals. The pride in caregiving uh, that, that was reflected the individual attention that animals received from their caregivers, a sense of codependency uh, between the animals and their caregivers, and livestock ownership and level of care were connected. People that owned the animals were responsible for providing the care. Let's skip ahead to the emerging paradigm of the relationship between livestock and people. Now, the majority of Americans are not farmers and have limited or no experience with livestock. And as a result, their exposure and understanding of animals is often limited to their experiences with companion animals and visits to zoos or sanctuary or the mass media. Along this same transition, animal husbandry gave way to specialized career in which the approach was to rename departments of animal husbandry, animal science. My degree is actually in animal husbandry in, from 1974 from the University of Missouri, Columbia. I'm not sure what year they made that transition, but it was in the mid 70s. Today, as a sociologist teaching at Iowa State University to, to, to non-farm kids, I'm oftentimes asked the question, how can you love an animal that you're raising to kill. Let's look now at some of the images of the emerging paradigm, and I'll ask you to think about what are the values, what are the messages uh, in these, of these photographs. Uh, contemporary facilities, uh, uh, this, in this case, a confinement facility, uh, uh, cattle feedlot, modern day milking parlor, a modern day swine production facility, uh, broilers, 4-H, show ring. Leon Sheets of Ione, Iowa posted the pictures of his farm and pig barn from a blizzard that we had on February 23, uh, uh, th this last month. Uh, I wanted to show you these pictures because here in the first picture is uh, Mr. Sheets uh, with his tractor trying to get to his big barn. You can see going through the snow drifts. This is an outside picture of his pig barn. Here in the foreground, you can see the LP propane tank that's almost buried and you get a sense of the drifts by how high they are on the side of the building. The important message here is to look inside his buildings where his pigs uh, seem to be warm and comfortable. Now, what are the values being reflected in this set of pictures? The message that we may not intend, but we need to be mindful of, livestock are reared in, in large impersonal environments. Individual attention has declined or is missing. Often the human component of care or the husbandry is not shown. Often, the ownership of stock is distinct from caregiving. Those who provide care often do not own the livestock. So if we look at that sort of a side-by-side -side comparison, the historic paradigm was based around small-scale production and processing, experientially learned or based. We learned animal care from our parents and was passed down sort of learning by doing. Ownership and care was provided by the same person. And our values about livestock were learned 
by working alongside of our parents. The emerging paradigm, livestock are raised in large scale production and processing facilities. Often people have little or no experience with livestock. Ownership is frequently divorced from those who provide care. And, and in many cases, the values around animals is learned from the mass media. Now, I think we need to think about the other part of what that oftentimes goes unrecognized is the livestock and poultry industry's contributions to society. While we may be well versed in talking about meat, milk, and eggs, along with other secondary products such as leathers and pharmaceuticals, oftentimes we don't spend enough time talking about the rural development side of creating jobs on farms and in local processing plants. Oftentimes we fail to acknowledge the conservation of natural resources that, that, that animals can, can convert non-digestible uh, feedstocks into human food, that pasture and hayland helps reduce erosion, especially on some of our fragile soils. And oftentimes we fail to talk about how livestock contributes to sustainability, both in terms of soil fertility and the organic matter that's enhanced by animal manure. To the question of jobs, and a question that I would hope all of us would be talking about, does livestock and poultry production and processing provide meaningful jobs that you would want your children to pursue? Many farms no longer have livestock because it's hard work or there's too much work. It requires daily chores, in, too often, low profits have discouraged livestock production, and in some cases, a lack of opportunities in getting started. As a sociologist, it's ironic that oftentimes we spend more attention on the welfare of stock than to the caregivers or to the workers uh, in the industry, something that I think looms large on a future agenda. Two important trends uh, on how animals are perceived relates to anthropomorphism. That really is the tendency to attribute or ascribe human qualities, such as emotions and intentions, to animals. This is particularly evident in pets and companion animals, where we believe they have, where people want to believe an assumed truth, remember belief is an assumed truth, that pets and companion animals have emotions and, and communicate with us. It's not surprising then that we see what's called transference. Transference of these beliefs of human qualities to animals being shifted from pets to livestock. The third component of this tied to this is sentences the sentences is the ability to, to perceive and feel things. And a number of people talk about the capability of being aware of its surroundings, animals' relationship to other animals and to people, and sensation in its own bodies, including pain, hunger, heat, cold, loneliness, abandonment, etc. Those, if we talk about an animal being sentenced, they have some of those qualities. We, I think, as a society, have contributed to some of this uh, notion of anthropomorphism and sentences by where do children learn about animals? Values are transmitted uh, through socialization, through cartoon characters. While we recognize these are cartoon characters, they are animated to show human qualities, and I'm not going to go through all these, but you recognize them. In addition to cartoon characters, there's a whole raft of movies out there dating back to 1942 with the release of Walt Disney Bambi, uh, right through the current times, of animals featured in movies that, or, or videos that have human-like qualities, feelings, emotions. Uh, so it's not surprising 
We also see that with, with real live. So Silver and Gentle Ben, Arnold the Pig, from those of you that remember uh, Green Acres and Bear, these are actual movies that featured these animals uh, and through the magic of Hollywood had human-like qualities. This then raises up the spectrum of if people believe that animals have human qualities, the concern about increased concern about animal welfare, or what some people might say happiness, and I put a question mark there. But the, but the question should be how to measure animal welfare and judgments about what animals desire, judgments about the animal's feelings, pain, intelligence, and sociability. I don't know which production facility is preferred by livestock, but I know that some days it's better than others. And if I were to look at, at uh, Mr. Sheep's uh, blizzard versus being out on a nice warm sunny day with, uh, with a feeder and shade. But again, we have to think about not those of us versed in livestock production as much as those that have no experience or understanding. The important message that I wanted to leave with you all is the importance that animal welfare is broader than livestock. And most people recognize that humane treatment of animals is essential, but it's also essential across all categories of animals, livestock and poultry, companion animals, wildlife, zoos, research facilities. The values and beliefs that are shaped by our experiences with, with pets, our viewing of animals in the movies or in cartoon characters are now being applied to livestock. What I believe we're seeing is the emergence of, of a new food system that places more emphasis on place of origin. Consumers want to know where their food comes from and under what conditions uh, it was raised and harvested. Uh, we also see the importance of reconnecting with producers and consumers. Some of that is, is put under the category of uh, food with a face or getting to know your farmer, oftentimes farmers markets or community supported agriculture highlights that. In some cases, especially in urban areas, we see the emergence of a local food system. The green movement would be put in there which suggests to me that we need to place more emphasis on explaining modern food production and processing. How do we then go about reconnecting with animals? Given that there's a diverse range of opinions and values and beliefs about human responsibilities and duties towards animals, is highlighted by the fact that there are over 200 national and international groups and organizations that speak on the issue of, of animal care and welfare. Let me give you a couple of examples that I think highlight some initial efforts to bridge this gulf or this gap in knowledge. So the National Pork Board, We Care Principles. Many of you are familiar with those about the importance, the value. I want you to think about the value that, this, that these principles are trying to extend, producing safe food protecting and promoting animal well-being, ensuring practices to protect human health, safeguarding natural resources, providing a work environment that is safe and consistent with other ethical principles, contributing to a better quality of life in our communities. See how those begin to resonate in, in building uh, trust and reciprocity with consumers and non-farm groups. Jen Sorensen of Iowa Select uh, identified 10 principles on what makes a good pig caretaker. And I'm borrowing this. This is Jen and her, her team that work at Iowa Select. Observe and act, have a solid mastery of animal science, communicate early and often, be a lifelong learner, be a problem solver, practice patience, find your happy place, take ownership always, have a teamwork approach and fall in love with your job. Again, these are, these are now hearkening back to me that what is a good animal caretaker? 
This is about animal husbandry. As we look to the need to integrate the human dimensions into, into livestock per production, perhaps animal science, that's why I struck through it, should return to animal husbandry, the care of animals. We probably haven't done enough to articulate society's dependence on animals for human welfare. Have we made a convincing argument for the role of natural of livestock on our natural resource base? Uh, we know that there are significant ben microbial benefits of manure and soil health, which is a which is a big issue, not on, globally, uh, declining quality of soil, protection of fragile landscapes. So what I would like to do is spend a bit of time talking about searching for balance. The balance is to incorporate human values, beliefs, and attitudes into discussions about appropriate livestock production and processing methods. Regardless of species of, uh, or type of animal, we need to articulate the difference between pets and zoo animals, wildlife, and livestock. Recognizing that each deserves a special level of care and husbandry. Perhaps the livestock industry should learn, could learn how other animal industries and organizations are dealing with these new cultural issues surrounding animal care. Refuting or telling someone that they hold the wrong values is not effective. Have you ever won an argument by telling someone that their beliefs are wrong? I think you know the answer to that. We need to spend more time talking about why, what we do and why we do it and demonstrating the principles of sound animal husbandry. Well, thank you. Again, I apologize for not being able to be with you today, uh, but I did have to close this presentation out with a picture of my granddaughter born in January, and you can see that she's already developed a relationship uh, with her older brother's cat. Thank you.